I want to talk from the title this morning, Holy Ghost Partnership. Holy Ghost Partnership. You're not excited about it. That's all right. I'm going to get you there. Just, you don't got to fake it till you make it. I trust, I trust what he wants to do this morning and, and us get into that place. Holy Ghost Partnership. Here, here's, what I, here's what I want to do. I want to take us to Ephesians chapter 5. We're still in the book of Ephesians. We're still memorizing scripture. There's still time for some of you to memorize the scripture. We got the cards on the back table back here. Anyone want to, anyone want to recite the scripture by memory right now? Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Anybody want to recite it next week? No one. Their faith is so low. It's all right. Okay. No one even, you don't even believe you can memorize. It's not even, it's not even can we pray prayers that are impossible. Just can we memorize 10 passages of scripture? Nobody wants to raise their hand. All right. That's fine. You know what? It's really not fine. If someone should raise their hand, but I'm not going to make you do it. Yeah. Oh, was that, was that the like neighbor throw up or was that voluntary? 50, 50. All right. Next week. Hey, next week. We got to volunteer. Leave it to the youth to lead. Um, I hope that you will keep memorizing it. We've had some really powerful times doing that. The card is on the back. You can grab it. You can carry it with you in your car. You can have it. I, I know that what will happen is you'll get, just like me, you'll get stuck in a jam. Something will be happening. And what will come out will be the flesh instead of the spirit. But if we dedicate ourselves to memorizing the word of God, what comes out is the word of God. That's why it's important. That's why I want to make you feel uncomfortable that you're not memorizing the scripture. Because the reality is we should be. So if you feel a little bit uncomfortable, like, oh, man, I should have, I, I don't really want to raise my hand, but I feel like kind of uncomfortable, I'm good. That's okay. Because it's not all about our comfort. Sometimes it's about our obedience, believe it or not. And so in that, I want us to turn to chapter 5 of Ephesians. We're getting so excited for who's going to be reading the scripture, memorizing the scripture for next week. And there's a week after that, too, so you still got time, all right? Multiple people. I'll be, I'll be open to multiple people reciting the scripture next week. Here's what it says, starting in verse 1 of chapter 5. It says, therefore, be imitators of God, beloved children. God loves you so much. And walk in love as Christ loved us, and he gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. What a great start. God loves you. Jesus gave his life for you. It was a fragrant sacrifice. You're his beloved children. Then he says, verse 3, But sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints. The fear, I won't say fear, the concern in my heart as one of the members of the body of Christ is if I were up here, and I'm not going to do this, but if I were to say, has anyone seen any good shows lately? Raise your hand. I'd love to hear about it. Look, Alex already raised his hand. I didn't, even, I didn't even ask you. I was just being hypothetical. I think five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hands might go up. But when I say, anyone want to memorize the scripture next week? Everyone's like, I don't know, Pastor Mac, you know, like. I'm like, how about try and you don't do it? That'd be okay. Maybe you could get five verses. I'd be all right with it. It says in the word of God that we are his beloved and also, just as true as that statement, but let no sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness even be named, not be practiced, even be named among us. Let there be no filthiness, foolish talk or crude joking, which is out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. You should be convicted, as am I. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God in Christ. Let no one deceive you with empty words because of the things of the wrath of God comes up upon the sons of disobedience. Verse 7. Therefore, do not become partners with them. My question for you this morning is, what are you partnered with? What are you partnered with? What have you consciously or subconsciously decided to make a partnership with? Here's how I can show you what we're partnered with. What we spend our time doing and what we value. 
What do you spend your time doing and what do you value? Those are things that you've made partnership with. So if you, if you make a list, you may have partnership with a lot of things. But if you make a list, and if you're being really truthful, not even lying to yourself, which sometimes we do. We lie to ourselves and we pretend. We just tell our mind like it's not true, but we know that it is. And we were listing the things that we spent our time intentionally valuing. All right, We would make a list of it. Would the Holy Ghost make the list? Or not? Coming to church might make the list. That's great. I want you here. The body of Christ is important. It's great to gather. But what about walking with God? Would it make the list? What about just hearing from him and talking to him as you're doing things in the house? You're just moving around the house and you're just spending time with God. Would it make the list? Is that the partnership that you have? Or is it only texting people? I text, I use my phone, I use my phone a lot. I use it to work, I use it to communicate with you guys, I use it to do emails. I hardly ever open up my actual laptop computer. I don't think I've opened it in months. I just have it all in this little pocket machine in my pocket. Pull it out, boom. So I get it, I'm on my phone. But I walk around, I told my wife, this, maybe even this week, I'm like, I don't know, we might be doomed. Because people are just walking around and they're just glued to it. They're not even paying attention. I'm saying hi to people as I walk through the mall and they do not even know that I'm saying hi to them. I'm not talking about 12-year-olds. I'm talking about 30-year-olds. We've for sure made a partnership with that. We know that, all right? Hopefully we're doing good stuff on it because we're fully partnered. We're so partnered. We're so partnered with it, they don't even have to put us in a contract anymore because they know you cannot live without it. No point in locking you in. They don't even care. It's actually more beneficial that they don't lock you in into an agreement because then they can just change it as they want to go. Because you're not giving it up. we got to have our phones. How would we ever get anywhere? We're using GPS to go home from work every day. It's like you go every day. Stop using your GPS. It's making you dumber, all right? Ask my wife. I am anti-GPS. I only use it when I have to. I don't even want to turn it on. I just pull it up. I check the maps. Turn it off. Like the old days. Like when you had a piece of paper. You printed the instructions off of MapQuest. <laughs> and you had a piece of paper on there. You go on the family trip. And you have the map. And it's on a little spiral. And you've got to turn the pages. And you're like, you're flipping it back to see, did I make the right exit or the wrong exit? Forget bathroom stops. You know, can't look that up. You're just having to go by what you see, you know. By faith. I love the convenience. I love what it's doing. I, there, there's so many great things that it provides. I'm not telling you to throw it away. I'm asking, are you first partnered with the Holy Spirit or are you first partnered with Steve Jobs? Are you first partnered with what looks good and what feels good and what is right or are you first partnered with the convictions that the Holy Spirit brings? Because if we're first partnered with what feels good and what's right, inevitably, every single time, we are going to slip into exactly what it talks about in verses 3 through 4. Sorry, 6. We're going to slip into making jokes that are inappropriate because they get laughs. We're going to slip into talking bad about someone because people around us like it and it makes us look good. We're going to slip into wanting what somebody else has because we wish that we had the happiness that they have and they're not even happy. But when we're partnered with the Holy Spirit, when we're partnered with the Holy Spirit, then we hear what He knows. We have clarity on what's happening around us. We don't have to get anxious about what might never happen and most likely will never happen because we have certainty that we are in His hands, that He has us, that He knows what's going on, that He is leading us. What you're partnered with can either hinder or increase the effectiveness of our assignment. And some of you are like, what's my assignment? A lot of what we're partnered with ends up hindering what we're actually called to do. 
Sometimes even our good habits. I was getting convicted this week. Even habits that we have that are good. You wake up and you have a habit. I'm going to read my Bible this time. I'm going to do this. It's good spiritual habits. I'm, I'm, I'm making my habits what I'm partnered with rather than being partnered with the Holy Ghost. The whole reason I got the habits was to partner with the Holy Spirit, but now my habits have become what is most important. More important than really being with God, I have the habits that I do. This is what I do. I check this box, and they're good things. At one point, they were what was drawing me closer to God, but then they can become what keeps me at a distance. I got closer, I sensed the closeness, but the habits have become a barrier for me. Now I'm partnered with the habits instead of partnered with the Spirit. If we are not at least processing these thoughts and bringing them to the Lord to show us, should we be convicted, are we living right, then we're not being mature enough to walk in the Spirit of God. What are you partnered with? I see the potential of partnership in the room. I see, I see all of a sudden extra hours found in a week to do things that you never thought you could do for Jesus. I see phone calls being made to encourage people in the spirit. I see text messages being sent. I see the the use of technology could be shifted in the room that it's not just for our own pleasure to scroll and to see what else thing we need to buy and to see what ads they're going to give us so they know. Do you you at least realize that when when you open up Netflix and it tells you, here's the top 10 things, this is what they're saying, you should watch this. Do they love you? No. Does Netflix care about you? No. So what does the Holy Spirit say are the top 10 things that we should watch? I see time that is made available as we decide to partner with the Holy Spirit. And I see the word busy dropping to the floor because we're not too busy for the things of God. We just want other things. And if we begin to partner and let ourselves be partnered with the word of God and we're linked hand in hand with what God is doing, all of a sudden what he's at work with becomes what I'm at work with. I'm partnered with my wife. The, the, the burden of being partnered with my wife is that when she's sad, I'm sad. That's the, it's, it's the hard part. It's my joy, but don't we just, we always just want to be happy. We always just want to feel good. When she's down, my heart cares. When she's happy, it makes it easier for me to be happy. It's the joy. It's the same thing in partnering with the Holy Spirit. The burden is that when his heart is sad towards something, when his heart is moved, our heart too must be moved. Or we let go hands. When his heart is filled with joy about something, then our heart becomes filled with joy about that very thing because we are partnered with the Holy Spirit. We're beginning to feel our actual feelings are beginning to sense how the Holy Spirit is. Partnership happening in the room. Let's turn to verse 8. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are the light of the world. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in what is good and what is true and what is right. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Do you see? Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, not tolerate them. I'm not talking about you exposing what's happening in your neighbor's life. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you exposing what's happening in your life. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that these people do in secret. But when anything is exposed in light, it becomes visible for anything that becomes visible, in turn, is light. Then it says, wake up. Wake up. 
Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And I want our spiritual eyes to wake up. I want to, I want to ask us spiritually, what are we partnering with? And spiritually, are we awake? Not are we woke, are we awake? Not do you know all that's happening in media, and are you well-versed in what's happening in the colleges, and are you well-versed in your education? Are you well-versed in what the Holy Spirit is saying, and how he is moving, and what is that working? Do you feel what he's saying this week? Wake up! That we might see what's happening in the kingdom of God. That we might see where he is moving and partner with that work. Instead of deciding what we want and begging God to come over and bless it. Come on God, don't you see how hard I'm working? Come bless this. You can beg God to bless where you're at or you can join God where he's at. This is partnership. This is being awake to what God is doing. It's saying, remember, I want to bring you back to the heart of what we're talking about. We're reading the book, the letter. It's a letter written by Paul to Ephesus. Now, we've been in this for 10 weeks, so it's easy to forget what's happening. Or maybe you weren't even here 10 weeks ago when we started. Maybe you weren't even here three weeks ago. And he's writing a letter to encourage people that are living for Jesus. He's not beating them up. He's not writing because they're bad. They're bad Christians. I gotta write, I gotta tell them how to be good Christians. No. There's letters of rebuke in the Word of God. There's times when the people of God have to write a letter to a group of people because they're not living for Jesus. We see that. This isn't even that. This is writing to the people of God who are living for Jesus in an affluent city that is surrounded by a corruption. They're standing bold with their faith and they're choosing Christ in a time that's unpopular. Sound familiar to you? Sound like any cities that you might live in? They're choosing this. And even still, he writes to them and he says, wake up. Wake up to the numbness in some of the areas of our life where we have allowed sin to run its course while in one hand we worship and in the other hand we think on what is impure. Stop stuffing it down deep and allowing ourselves to forget about it and instead let it be exposed to the Holy Spirit that he might bring healing to us and greater partnership might be formed. I see in the Spirit opportunity to wake up. I see in the Spirit, see, when, when, you, when you're awake, you're different than when you're asleep. When I'm asleep, I'm very different than when I'm awake. The beard, all smushed over to one side. <laughs> just, just frumped over. Mashed up. I can wake up skinny beard, I can wake up fat beard. You don't know what you're going to get. This is a reality. I'm asleep. Do I care while I'm asleep? No, no, because I'm sleeping. I went and got me a new tempur pillow, the cooling one. So I sleep on a cooling pillow that feels like 65 degrees all night long. I'm out. Before or after the pillow, if my wife tries to wake me up while I'm sleeping, it does not go that great. I don't really particularly like it that much, believe it or not. Do you like being woken up in your sleep? No, not really. So do you think your spirit likes to be woke up in its sleep? No, not really. Are you groggy when you wake up? Have you been sleeping and you've been working hard all week at stuff that you probably shouldn't even been doing anyways? And when you wake up, you're feeling a little extra tired? Yeah. Are you most alert right when you wake up? No. Takes a little time, you know, you gotta put a little, you gotta put a little, I don't drink coffee, you gotta put a little coffee in you. That Christian liquid courage. That Christian wake go go juice you gotta get. So you can wake up. Now, this is just all physical. But it's the same way in the spirit. When you're being jolted to wake up, does the enemy want you to wake up in the spirit? No. No, he does not. 
And if we keep going to sleep over and over and over again, and we just keep sleeping longer, becoming less aware of what God is doing, and more about what we're doing, and more into our agendas, and less partnered with Him, we just become sleepier and sleepier and sleepier. Even you're yawning now, I'm saying the word sleep, and you're thinking, oh man, I'm kind of getting a little, I could use a nap right now. Why not? Dim those lights back, kind of lean on the person next to you a little bit. It could happen. It's time for the church, the bride of Christ, to spiritually wake up in our city. This written so long ago, how could it still be true? How many people do you know that claim to be Christians and you know they don't live for Christ? How many people say that same thing about you? But yet when I look in the room, I see the potential of boldness and people waking up in their faith and deciding to speak the word of God and to, and to expose what is dark in their own lives and say, I don't want any part of it. It shouldn't even be spoken around me. You can't even speak it around me. We went to the Ranger game last night, yesterday afternoon. Got some good seats, had a good time at the Ranger game. It was a baseball bat giveaway, you know. And this guy sat behind us. And we overheard him talking on the phone, and he did not buy the seats that he was sitting in. He was like snuck in, you know? So then he was inviting his friends to also sneak in. He was a loud talker. You know, he was like screaming for the opposing team. And, you know, just having a good time and stuff like that. Getting a little loose, you know? So his buddies show up, and they start chatting. And in the first, like, sentence they're talking... They throw a couple curse words in there. You know, just a couple F-bombs just kind of drop in there. Not faith, by the way, the other F-word, all right? In my house, when we use the F-word, it's faith. Hallelujah. <laughs> but they throw in the other word. And let me just tell you, like, I wasn't mad or upset at them. But I just turned around to the guy, and I just kind of gave him a look like, hey, I'm holding a one-year-old. So if you wouldn't mind not saying some of those words, that would be great. Just very, like, polite, like, hey, you know, like, and he was like, oh, yeah, 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 for sure. Because that's kind of appropriate, I mean, you know. But how often is it okay when it happens around you, and forget the guy behind the row, when it's just people talking to you and using derogatory, racist, profanity things, and you just sit there, and you just take it because you're like, I don't want to be rude. You don't have to be rude to stand in your faith. And everybody knows when there's just a one and a half year old right there, it's kind of like, oh yeah, it's appropriate. But what about my ears too? Like, I didn't want to hear that. How often do we allow this to happen around us? And then what happens is what we allow to be around us, eventually we become partners with. This happens in relationships I tell young people all the time, you got to be careful who you're friends with because if you're friends with people you shouldn't be dating, eventually you'll be dating people you shouldn't be dating. Because who is familiar becomes who you're with. I mean, this, this is how I got this beautiful woman right here. I mean, she didn't want nothing to do with me. But if you just stick around long enough, <laughs> if you just don't give up, all right, if you'll just be persistent, eventually she's like, you know what? He must be a good guy because he's around. Luckily, it was mostly true. But this is the same way when it comes to any relationship. What we tolerate, we end up partnering with. What we let stick around, we end up becoming friends with. And so if you decide that, you know what, I'm not going to fornicate, but I don't really mind if it's nearby me, eventually you're going to be fornicating. Just proximity made it easy. I don't really want to be corrupt in my job and to do what's wrong. I want to have integrity. But if I'm around the people who are corrupt in the job, then guess what's going to happen? I'm eventually going to be standing in the same boat they're in. Because I'm asleep. Wake up your faith. You can wake up your faith by reading the word of God. 
You can wake up your faith by hearing the word of God. You can wake up your faith by getting around people that care about the word of God. You can wake up your faith by activating it in any way that allows you to serve God that is not for you or how you might look good or how you might feel good, but it's for the kingdom of God. I don't care if it's picking up trash in a parking lot or if it's going around and and waving to people. I don't care if it's evangelizing. It doesn't matter what it is. Just some way to activate your faith so you can physically be walking in what you wish you were doing. It's the potentials in the room. Verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as the unwise, but as the wise. Making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what is the will of the Lord, which you can only do, put this in there, through partnership with God. Do not get drunk on wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Say, be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God. The Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Partnership with the Holy Ghost involves you being awake, and it involves you being filled with the Spirit. I don't want to get into a theological debate because, honestly, it doesn't really matter that much to me whether a person gets filled with the Spirit upon salvation or filled with the Spirit later. What I have resolved is that clearly speaking in tongues is not a sign of being filled with the Spirit, but rather having the gifts of the Spirit are a sign of being filled with the Spirit. And how do you know what you have if you don't use what you have? A sign of being filled with the Spirit is that there's spiritual gifts listed in Scripture that are being used in your life, that are coming out in your life because the Spirit is on you and you are being, you are being, as you're partnering with the Spirit, continually filled that you might pour out through these spiritual gifts and impact the people that are around you. He's writing to a mature audience that are believers in a time when there wasn't, when it wasn't popular to believe, in a time when it was hard to believe. And he's saying to those believers, be filled with the Spirit. And so I say to our believers here in this room, to myself, to us, to those who are around us, I say be filled with the Spirit. There were times, like I said in Scripture, around the same time when people were taking handkerchiefs and they were praying over them. And they were sending them out to people. And when the other when the other when they when they got where they needed to be, and on the other end, they touched the hanky, they received healing at the other end. And you know, there's been times throughout the decades where preachers have stood up and they've said, send in five dollars and we're gonna send you this miracle hanky. There's also been times where internet pornography has run rampant, okay? There's been lots of times where things have happened. List times. There have been times where the newspaper is popular, and right now it's not, okay? There's been times. It doesn't change the word of God. It doesn't change the power and the practice that's in Scripture. You know, if you think about the handkerchief, it has a job. Its job is to wipe what shouldn't be there, to blow your nose, get a little spit off, keep the boogies out, you know. It has a job. And then all of a sudden, this thing that had a job, and I guarantee you when they were passing around handkerchiefs, they were passing around a work handkerchief. All of a sudden, this thing that had a job became this thing that was just pretty. Most people that carry a handkerchief or wear a handkerchief now, they do it because it's decorative, it's nice. And something that was meant to do a job all of a sudden became decorative. Just slot it in your pocket. You got a pocket over here. You probably got a hanky on you, don't you? There, you, do, you put it in there. It's just like 
Boom. You see right there? Look at that. This is a model right here. I'm not going to make you walk around. All of a sudden, what was meant for work becomes decorative. And I wonder this morning if it's the same way with our faith. Your faith was meant to work. It was meant to do a job. It was meant to overturn spiritual forces of darkness in heavenly places. It says, it says that by strength, by the strength of the Lord, stand firm. And our, our faith that was meant to work has become decorative. We put it on a shelf. We put it in a pocket to look pretty. This is our faith. This is how it looks. I want to turn that over. I wanted to make it to where our faith is doing the work that it should be doing. It's getting back to the roots of what it should be. That it's setting people free. That it's calling the captives free. That it's, that it's saying to those who are hurting that they're healed. That it's saying to our own mind that we are free in Christ. That it's declaring to the city that Jesus is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. That it's saying salvation is for every person who believes. That with the tongue confess and with the mouth believe and you shall be saved. That it's saying that, that we should be obedient and to walk in faith. And that we should not be hindered. And that those who, who will mount up on the wings of eagles they will not grow weary they will keep it, it's saying the word of God it's not just a decorative thing it's not just coming to church to say hey I checked the box I was here but it's really to live out the word of God and I want to give opportunity for that here's, here's my heart for the, for the next moments I've taken some of the hankies to make it really practical for you. I'll set them right here for now. And I've cut them into little squares. And what I would love for some of us to do, not, I don't know that it's for all of us to do, but what I would love for some of us to do is, I would love for us to decide that, that we partner with the Holy Ghost and for us to come down and either be filled with the Spirit and decide that no longer will we walk in the flesh and just say, oh yeah, we're saved, we're not going to hell. But our life has no proof of what the Holy Spirit is doing and how we're partnered with Him. And to decide, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's as simple as asking God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. In the same way, it's as simple as asking for salvation. And sometimes it feels like something, and sometimes it doesn't feel like anything. We don't go by what we feel, we go by what we faith. And for some of us that are already partnered and filled with the Holy Spirit, I want us to come down and grab one of these also to decide that our faith is not decorative, that it goes to work. And when we come down and we grab one, I want us to then pray about what the purpose of this piece of handkerchief might be. Who does it need to go to that they might receive healing? that we might maybe sneak it under the doormat of their house or slide it into the nightstand next to their bed or put it into one of the drawers that it might be in their house that, that through the power of the Holy Spirit we're by faith saying, you know what? Miracles are happening here. I'm just declaring it with, with what I got. I'm, you, you don't think it took faith for, for Paul and the other, the other apostles and other disciples to send handkerchiefs across regions that people might be healed because they couldn't go? That took faith. That's absurd. There was no precedent for that. They just decided their faith would go with it, and by spirit they went. We're so worried about precedent. What can happen and what can't and what rules there are. What rules are there to the Holy Ghost that don't involve love? Very little. Maybe it's taking one and placing it in our pocket. So as we walk around this week, we remember, we put our hand in our pocket, we remember, I can't walk in darkness, I gotta walk in light. I can't walk walk partnered with everything else the world is trying to sell me. i got to walk partnered with the Holy Spirit. 
But regardless of what you decide and what the Holy Spirit leads you to have the purpose with this piece of hanky to be, I'm hoping that in this time we can make bold declarations to say, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm going to continue to walk in Him, or I need the filling of the Holy Spirit that I might continue to walk in Him. Because it's clear in God's Word to wake up, to be partnered, and then to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And without that, we're walking around with no strength to do life. Without that, our faith becomes more decorative than it does effective. I want to pray. I want to ask for this time of response. And here's what I want to do. I want to be down on the front. Some of you, I believe that maybe even just for a minute, if I could just partner with you. Pray, touch your hand. Maybe some of you during this time, as you come down, you want prayer. I'd love to pray with you. But you can't come down and pray to God, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit, and then walk out and say, I don't think I'm filled with the Holy Spirit because I just taught you the biblical principle of what you speak and what you walk in. So come down by faith, take it by faith, leave by faith, walk by faith. That's the only way. Man, I hope you were so encouraged by that word, but my hope and my prayer is that you would take that word and you would carry it throughout your day. That you would allow that word right there to not only impact just this moment, but to impact tomorrow and to impact the next week and to impact the next month and the next year and your family. Allow it to just spread all over your life. Do not leave this moment just being a moment. It is so much more than that. And I'm excited to hear the testimonies about how God is gonna move faithfully in your life. And isn't God so faithful? He faithfully moves in everyone's lives. And in a way that my wife and I have seen God move is through our finances. And why he moves is because we choose to partner our finances with our faith and we choose to give. And so maybe today is your day to begin giving. There's a couple of ways that you can give. You can go to authentic.church and give under the gift tab, or you can give through Venmo. Hey, I love you and I cannot wait to see you guys next week.